Are you able to communicate the way to communicate to people who are, who are running? Uh, you know, I, yeah. we, we've got, I think Santorum's in as of today. That makes 12 or 13. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. who, who, well, who do you, you talk know. to? How do you talk to them? How do you get the message into the, into the brains and ultimately out of the mouths of other people who are running for office. Well, the, the great privilege uh, when you're either the American Enterprise Institute or the Heritage Foundation is that they come to us. Okay. They come to us and they're in search of ideas, but one of the things that a lot of candidates don't know is what they really need the most is communications. I mean, it's, it's not as if they're overburdened by too many ideas, don't get me wrong. Ideas matter a lot too, and there's a kind of a poverty of ideas from a, in a lot of politicians, not, n not all by any means. But they need those too. But one of the things that they're all badly in need of is the way to express particular ideas. You know, they, 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 the biggest problem with being a conservative politician today is that people misinterpret your intent constantly. I mean, I talked about the two congressmen because for a reason in the outset of my remarks. It's astonishing what people think. I mean, you, you, the, the truth is, here's a, here's a question that the Pew Research Center asked uh, uh, about 5,000 Americans last year. Do you believe that the word compassionate accurately describes the Republican Party? No outranked yes, 11 to 1. <laughs> 11 to 1, okay, 55% to 5%. If you rent, the people who said yes are paid staff, blood relatives, and round to zero. I mean, that's, that's a huge problem when, I mean, I understand that, that compassion is not the job of government of the Republican Party, but when people don't associate the conservative political movement with people that are trying to fight for others, we're simply not going to make enough progress. And so helping people to describe what's written on their hearts, first of all, the compassion and fairness that they feel toward others is, uh, is principle number one. Yeah. So we had a president not too long ago, for you and me anyway, uh, who always talked about compassionate conservatism, George H.W. Right. Bush. Uh, but the one who really communicated it from the heart and who now knew how to communicate it was Ronald Reagan. So how do we get today's gang to not just say, oh, I'm a Reagan conservative, but actually to yeah. be able to do that better? That's right. So Reagan was really good at it. What, what was Reagan's trick? We, re we misremember what Reagan actually did for the conservative movement. We remember his policies. We remember the what of Reagan. We forget the why of Reagan. The what of Reagan was increasing the defense budget and cutting taxes, et cetera, was the, the, the policy moves that he made that were broadly hostile to tax rates and the size of government. The why of Reagan is actually more profound because the why of Reagan is really eternal. It's the why of us, too. The why was trying to give more people a better life, trying to facilitate an ecosystem of freedom that's going to allow people to live in a, in a, in a country, in a world of opportunity. He, he, look, I grew up in a household where nobody voted for Reagan. I knew no one person in the world who voted for Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was first elected when I was 16 years old, so I was, I was sentient. And uh, so how did he get elected? That's so weird. Nobody voted for him. And it turns out that nobody in Seattle voted for him. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, so what, but you know, by the, by the time I was 17 or 18, I remember thinking, Reagan loves me. I've never met him. Reagan loves me. Why? Why did I think that? Because he did. Because he did. Reagan actually wanted the best for everybody, including people who didn't like him and didn't vote for him, who actually thought he was stupid and evil. He loved everybody. He wanted the best for every American, and indeed for people all around the world. If we can express that, we're in good shape. Now, there's interesting, there's a study that I should tell you about. It's by a guy who teaches at GW. His name is Danny Hayes. He's a political scientist. He's a, he's a liberal, but he's, he does great work. Uh, and Danny Hayes has done a study on, on political traits. Political traits are what you're endowed with automatically when something that nobody, they don't know anything about you except your political party affiliation. So I look around this group, these, most of you are registered Republicans and you're all either libertarians or conservatives. And so what traits do you get automatically? You get morality and strong leadership. Unless you're libertarians, you don't get morality. I'm kidding. And, uh, <laughs> and then um, the, uh, and if, you are, uh, if you're a liberal, what do you get? You get compassion and empathy. That's what you get automatically, right? So the question is, how do you sway voters? By doubling down on your natural traits or by trespassing on the traits of the other side? And he's got the answer. The studies are very, very clear. Trespass, steal, loot the house of the liberals.
go in there and steal their language and steal their ideas and steal their icons and do what they say they're all about, but do it as a conservative. See, the truth of the matter is, here's the great conservative paradox. We know how to help poor people. We know how to give people opportunity. We know how to lift people up, but people don't trust us to do it. They, on the other hand, talk about poverty. They talk about the alleviation of suffering and misery, but they don't know how to do it, and so they make things worse. So where is America going to go? They don't trust us, but they know that the other guys are a disaster area. You have incompetent compassion against pragmatic cold-heartedness. That's not a good choice. I don't like that choice, and neither does America. So go steal everything in their house that's beautiful and good and right. Take their icons, take their language, take their idols, especially take the parts of their policies that you can execute as a conservative or libertarian, and then let's watch a thousand flowers bloom because we're going to win. Yeah. A comment with a question. Your focus on joy and hope is stunning. Hope is called the theological virtue that's ordained to a certain end. For you, what end does hope look to? Well, there's me personally and there's me as a public policy analyst, to be sure. What I was talking about was hope toward earned success and human dignity. Hope that it can be done and I can do it. That's hope in the earthly realm. It's the best we can do in public policy. Me as a person, it's, it's like, like, I tell you, um, I, I was a musician for a long time, right? My favorite composer, Johann Sebastian Bach, right? It was a great, maybe the greatest composer who ever lived, 1685 to 1750. So productive, he published a thousand pieces uh, in his lifetime. He also had 20 kids. That's productive. Wow. And um, <laughs> Bach was asked near the end of his life, before he was a famous composer, he was a famous composer 100 years after he lived. Herr Bach, why do you write music? This gets to the subject of hope. Why do you write music? You know what his answer was? The aim and final end of all music is nothing less than the glory of God and the enjoyment of man. If I do my job in life, that's what I want to do too. I want to get to heaven and take as many people with me as I can. I want hope for something better for everybody. For me, this is deeply religious. For those for whom it isn't, we're talking about actually creating the best system for the best life for the most people. Hope. Wow. Were you ever in a seminary? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a seminary. That would mean I'm a failed priest, which is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay. AFF events often feature more men than women, though it's getting better. Hmm. What's the key to wooing more women? To our cause. Are you a woman wooer? A woman wooer. I, I wooed one woman, and that's a, I can't, it's hard to say. Say it six times fast. Um, look, the, one of the things, if you look at the public opinion polling, what bothers women about the conservative movement? And the answer is, generally speaking, it's the bullying, it's the, host, uh, the host, implicit hostility in the language, it's the sterility, it's the talk about money. What do women, are, are women attracted to the most in political movements? And the answer is help for the vulnerable. That's incidentally the same thing that's most attractive to non-voting Latinos is help for the vulnerable. That's the same thing that's the number one issue to 18 to 29 unaffiliated voters, help for the vulnerable. It's the same answer all across the board. And it's what we care about too. Look, I don't care about the tax rate for billionaires. I mean, it's. It's of passing interest to me as an economist, as a matter of economic efficiency, and that's great, but that's not why I'm in the movement. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna leave my tenured college professorship because I'm worried about a billionaire paying 39.6 versus 35% of the margin. That's nuts. I want something that actually is gonna lift people up. And so what's best for bringing women into the movement and Latinos and African Americans in 18 to 29s and you name it is the same thing that's gonna light our own hearts on fire. Let me throw out a, a, a statistic from, it's about four years old because it was in my book, Getting America Right. 89.6% of Latino parents want their kids to be fluent in English because they know that's the way to get ahead. Right. Now, man, can't we make something out of that? I mean, yeah. can't, we, can't we emphasize what's wrong with so much of our education system when they're, mm. they're insisting on uh, 65 languages in the LA public school system? Yeah. Like that. Look, 90% of Latinos for sure understand that English is the way for, for uh, to have a better life for more people. 
And, and in fact, that is true. That's simply realistic. But let's talk about actually how to blend and to put together a message that's going to be more attractive, to create a movement that's going to be more attractive to, to Latinos. And this is something I care an awful lot about. Um, as, you know, it, it, <laughs> If I'm not pro-immigration, I sleep on the couch. <laughs> so um, <laughs> um, uh, here, here's, here's the basic dynamics of voting behavior in the Latino community. Um, Latinos typically vote at half the rate of blacks and whites in presidential elections. So 78% of whites voted in 2012, and 79% of blacks voted in, 20, in 2012. And about half that rate, 40 or low 40%, in, in, in some areas at least, of Latinos voted. Okay, so you have a very low voting rate, and this is, not, this is among, by the way, I'm only talking about eligible Latinos, okay? Those who are either registered to vote or eligible to register to vote. So forgot about people who are undocumented in this country. That's not what I'm talking about. So the question is, what do we know about those Latinos who vote? The answer is they vote left. They vote left. 28% uh, or so voted for uh, uh, 72, 28 or something like that, voted uh, Obama versus versus Romney. Romney. But the really interesting thing is the half who don't vote. What are their characteristics? And the answer is they're more likely to self-identify as political conservatives than non-Hispanic whites in America. But they don't vote for a reason. Dig in a little bit, you find they're demobilized. They feel disaffected from the conservative movement and from Republican politics. They don't feel at home. By the way, this is the same story for Indian Americans, the single most successful immigrant movement or immigrant group in the United States currently today who vote 80-20 for Democrats in national elections, even though it seems to be entirely against their interests. Why? Because they don't feel at home. How do we make everybody feel at home? Are we an inclusive movement? that has representation and listens to the voices of people from all different groups? Are we being aggressive and active and reaching out to all different kinds of people? Do we have enough love in our hearts to look outside our community even more? The answer to that is really up to us, and the future is up to us as well. If you can unlock the non-voting half of eligible Latinos, game over. <laughs> it's done. I mean, suddenly, if you can unlock the, the non-voting conservative half People who stay home today in California, California becomes a purple state. Do you want to see fear in the eyes of Democrats? That's how you do it, by the way. And that's our challenge. Okay. July 14th this year will be more than Bastille Day. It's going to be a good day for you, isn't it? What's happening on July 14th? July 14th will be the 27th anniversary of the day I met my wife in no. Dijon, France. But that's not what you mean. No. <laughs> that's not what you mean. The, um, the uh, July 14th is the day that my new book comes out called The Conservative Heart, How to Build a Better, More Prosperous, Happier America that has a lot of the things that we've talked about here today and puts it in relatively consumable form. So if, uh, if it can be of any use to you, I, you know who I wrote it for? I wrote it, I wrote it for you, and I hope you like it. You, you had a sneak preview today, but yep. there's a lot more there's in the book, and we look from. forward to it. Yep, yep. Uh, now, my gonna, publisher is going to send me a free copy. I absolutely will. Of course. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> July 14th. Hey, I bought yeah. your last book, Ed. Come well, on. Well, there we go. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> the market clears. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's right. uh, there, here's one that, and it kind of it goes to what you're saying about how we ought to be stealing. Uh, ways and ideas from the other side. The question is, how do we bring back intelligent compromise on mutually interesting issues to our political governance? In other words, how do we get the other side to agree with our interpretation of the, the nice fuzzy words that they use, right. and when we use them that they're... Well, c compromise is tricky. Um, compromise in political discourse, I learned pretty quickly when I came to Washington, it uh, doesn't work very well, and part of the reason is because being a, a person of politically liberal persuasion means actually never compromising. There, um, it's all taking. It's no giving is how the political discourse works. So you can hand over one idea after another, et cetera, and realize that you've lost your shirt and pants and watch and shoes. What happened? There's this... Um, you know, it's, that's, that's basically that's kind of how my family dynamics work. You know, we're, we're going through this big thing. Where, should we go on vacation or get a couch? You know, my wife is Spanish. She's all about going on vacation. I'm thrifty. I want to get the couch, permanent. Like, couch, vacation, couch, vacation. Finally, we compromise and go on vacation. 
<laughs> you know, you know that's a, that's like negotiating with a liberal. I mean, that's and that's the problem with compromise under the circumstances. That the, the virtue is not compromise. And by the way, why is that unwise? Because our philosophy is completely mainstream. There's nothing pathological about the things that we say at AEI or Heritage. I understand that people call it really, really right wing. Why? Because who reflects on that? The intellectual class, the university class, the, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the journalistic class who are way, way to the left of the American people. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, on NPR, they say that heritage is right wing. Well, guess what? Everything's right wing to NPR. <laughs> so the, the truth is, if we're really mainstream, we represent mainstream American thinking, then compromise will move people off their, uh, their ideals. What we need is not compromise. What we need is flexibility. There are a lot of ways to get things done. You and I have run companies for a while. You ran Heritage for a long time. I've run AEI for a little time. And one of the things that you understand is you don't always get what you want. You're flexible in accepting certain things that you don't want for a greater good and for a greater goal. So if we have leadership ideals, not of compromise, but of flexibility, it puts things on a different plane and we can make better progress. <laughs> Yeah, flexibility and in terms of achieving those goals that at your place are right up there and at my place yep. are in every elevator when you go up and down. That's right. If yeah, you don't yeah. know what you're trying to achieve, then flexibility simply gets you to the end of the day. There you go. But if you're trying to get to a particular goal, you know what you're willing to be flexible. You know what you're willing to negotiate on. Um, if, and again, this requires a statement, an understanding of pure purpose, which well, is sadly lacking in a non-strategic environment like Congress. Yeah, yeah, right. That's one of another lesson to be learned, I think, from Reagan, who said, you know, I'll take 80% today and come back for the other 20% some, sometime later on. Uh -huh. Arthur, it's a, a great joy for all of us to be able to hear from you, to uh, look forward to July 14th in the next book, and I look forward to seeing you again in the not-too-distant future. And Thank you. Sharing ideas, have a good trip to New York today, and keep Thank banging you. your tin cup. Absolutely. And, uh, Thank you, AFF. Peter, congratulations on your unbelievable success. Thank you for what you're doing for America, and especially thank you to the great Ed Fulner. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, my friend. Goodness.